Hello, folks. I am so glad to be here with you at USU's Research Landscape. This is actually our efforts to link people with Utah State on many, many of the efforts and issues that are facing our state in land, water, and air. I'm Noel Cockett, president of Utah State, and uh, really, really glad to be back in person and being able to uh, welcome all of you to, to our event. Um, I especially am grateful that we have many city, state, and community leaders and stakeholders here with us today. And we've noticed that there's no group of individuals who care more about the challenges that are facing our state in land, water, and air. Now, we're hosted at the OC Tanner campus. Uh, we're very, very appreciative to them to be opening this beautiful venue in a very centrally located spot where uh, we can host our research landscaping presentation. And a special call out to President and CEO of OC Tanner, Dave Peterson, who also is a trustee uh, for Utah State University. Really appreciate their willingness to support us in this way. Um, I also wanna give a special shout out to our USU Office of Research and the research communications team under the Office of Research, which is very, very capably led by our very own Anna McIntyre. And she might, where is she? There, oh, there she is, way in the back, probably dealing with the sound system or something. Um, I'd also like to recognize some of the special guests that are here today, certainly not exhaustive because there's many, many good people, but I did want to call out Representative Doug Sagers, Representative Galen Binion, and then a couple of individuals that we have uh, from uh, some of the counties, Commissioner Tammy Pearson, and also a couple of individuals who uh, are part of Utah State, uh, Kent Alder, Chair of the USU Board of Trustees, and Jody Burnett, former Chair of the uh, USU Board of Trustees and now part of USU's foundation. Um, and in fact, Kent and Jody have helped many, many times as we kick off our research landscape. So glad they're here. Now, it's possible that you either forgot to RSVP or, and still came, which is okay, we're glad you're here, or we missed you. So if there's any other elected officials, could you please rise and then we'll uh, show our appreciation to all of you. Okay, we got you covered off. All right, so um, there's also several of our administrative leadership from Utah State, uh, deans and vice presidents. Stick up your hands there, good and high. Um, and then I'd really like to call out another special person, and that's Brian Steed. Now, Brian used to come to these uh, events as the executive director of the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Utah. But if you um, have been uh, connecting to USU's news, you would have noticed that we have been able to recruit and place Brian in the, as the new executive director of USU's Jana Quinney Lawson Institute for Land, Water, and Air. And um, absolutely so excited to have Brian with his connections, his leadership, and his understanding of natural resources to be able to continue to connect USU research with the state. We started the research landscape over four years ago, and some of you I know have been very, very regular attendees. Um, and the idea, again, was to connect people uh, with the research and outreach we do for, at USU on land, water, and air. And of course, those issues have become more urgent in the West, particularly water. Water takes a top spot in the worry list of citizens of Utah and uh, the West. So, um, but when you look at water issues, you have to consider agriculture. Agriculture and our use of water 
by agriculturists is key to managing Utah's water challenges. Last week, Governor Spencer Cox's office released Chapter 3 of his Coordinated Action Plan for Water, which focuses specifically on productive agriculture. As the report po points out, we need to involve agriculturists in our discussion because not only does it recognize the importance that Utah agriculture has for our state's economy, but we also uh, want to recognize the important contributions of our Utah farmers and ranchers in providing uh, and addressing food supply and food security, not only for Utah, but also the country and the world. Now, um, today we are pleased to have a conversation with uh, USU Associate Professor Matt Yost, and he will be our main presenter. He will share his take on these issues of land, water, air uh, with agriculture water optimization in Utah. Dr. Yost is a native of southern Idaho where he was raised on a dairy farm. After completing his PhD, he spent four years doing postdoctoral research in the Midwest. He is now the Agroclimate Extension Specialist uh, at Utah State, and he is the director of USU Crops. He's authored for numerous journal and extension articles on research dealing with water optimization, nitrogen management, precision agriculture, soil conservation, and bioenergy crops. Dr. Yost is highly regarded in Utah as a key expert on agriculture and agricultural irrigation. Before Matt presents, though, we will hear brief remarks from two special guests. Craig Butters is the commissioner of the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. Before that, he served as Cache County Executive for six years, County Councilman for six years, and member of the Utah House of Representatives for nine years. Before his public service, he spent the majority of his career as a dairy farmer. And that's actually my first contact with, with Craig was when I was dean of the College of Agriculture at Utah State. Commissioner Butters will be followed by Representative Casey Snyder, who represents House District 5 in Cache Valley. Represent Snyder, Representative Snyder has worked in the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, and in various other capacities at the national, state, and local levels of government. Snyder was raised in Liberty, Utah, and currently owns and operates a 300-acre farm in Cache Valley. So let's go ahead and get our program started with Commissioner Butters. Thank you so much, President Cockett. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. I have uh, I've enjoyed these meetings in the past when I've been here, and it amazes me the amount of research that's going on and taking place. And, and agricultural research has a, has a really soft place in my heart. Um, this is the higher farm in Lewiston. <laughs> Most of you probably won't even know, but this, this was a part of my childhood. This is, this is where I grew up. This is basically home to me, but I did find out that uh, Dr. Yost and I uh, share uh, more in common than just coming from a dairy farm. We actually live very close to each other in Smithfield, and I just found that out today. But Smithfield and Cache Valley is, is my home. I won't take much time, but I just wanted to, to point out that <clears throat> the department is very uh, involved right now in ag water optimization programs. We started the water optimization program in 2019 with $3 million of funding that came through the state legislature. And with that first round of funding, we saw projects that uh, created water savings of over 24,000 acre feet and also 7 billion gallons of water. So the success of that first year led to another $3 million of funding that was appropriated in 2021. And now with the federal ARPA funds available, another $70 million that it has been uh, earmarked for these water optimization projects. And so this current, this 
this year's round of water optimization projects, we had about 194 applications. There were 140 that were approved, and total funding will be, uh, for these projects in this first round, is going to be $25.5 million. So you can see there's going to be significant, significant investment in agricultural water um, savings. Now this is a 50-50 uh, match program, so all of those dollars are matched by the producer with other do dollars that there are available. And it's a $500,000 limit on each one of those projects. So a lot of exciting things happening there. But I just, I wanted to just kind of talk briefly about the importance of agriculture in the state. I think that the public is beginning to recognize the importance of agriculture. But there is a, a, there is a uh, kind of a divide in the public as far as the, the uh, impression of how important agriculture is in the state. Some individuals you may hear say that, uh, why are we even using irrigation water on agriculture when we've got so many other needs in the state. It's my <clears throat> belief that the, uh, our ecosystem benefits greatly by the irrigated farms and ranches that we have. Uh, these are some of the ways that we benefit through water recharge to our aquifer, through return flow into our rivers and streams, uh, for wildlife habitat, and our vistas and our greenscapes. When people leave the city and go out into the country, they don't want to see a dry landscape. I mean, we do have a lot of beautiful, beautiful red rock country, but when you mix that red rock with the green of our agricultural operations, our farms and ranches, that contributes to the beauty of our state. Also, we have a, we have a great, several great programs in the department our agriculture voluntary incentive program uh, is a is a water improvement program where we we work with the cooperators to manage their nutrient levels and we also have our soil health program and uh, there are many things that we're doing at the department right now and all of those things benefit from the research that utah state university does we, uh, we need that to be able to tell our story. So thank you so much for, for inviting us to be here and, and we look forward to hearing from Dr. Yost. Thank you. Um, again, Representative Casey Snyder, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. There's a lot more knowledge on that side of the room. Just want you to know over here, there's a bit of a dearth, but I am in politics, so I'm gonna talk and pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I wanna, I, I kinda wanna frame the conversation before we get into the real meat of this whole discussion um, by maybe lightly and mildly insulting everyone. Uh, th there's this notion that I think all of us have that somehow our time is unique and that all of us are special. Like the challenges we face are new and, and there's, we, we, it, it's, never been ha it's never happened before. Well, you're wrong and you're not. And, and, I, and I'll kind of verify my claims with a little bit of history. So it, it, at least personal history to me, maybe I'm the only one that is mistaken. Um, my family homesteaded Ogden Valley and Liberty in, in particular. And I grew up there and, and, and farmed there as a kid. And my great, great grandfather, <clears throat> was a rel relative, he was, he was a giant, he was 6'7". He married a very short woman and ruined every generation after him. Um, but in his time, he was a very big man. And he, it was said of him, so he, he settled Liberty from North Ogden, and he, would, he was strong enough that he would take a plow and he would throw it over his shoulder, his horses would go up in front of him, he would haul that plow over North Ogden Divide, farm all day, and then carry the plow and drive the horses back. So he, he was a big man. And, and, and generally kind. Um, so his name was, his name was Robert Montgomery. Uh, he interacted with a man whose name was Will Southwick. So uh, Will, by all accounts, was, was gentle in his, he, he was held various uh, positions in his local church. And by his own journal accounts, he said, I, I never fought anyone or harmed anyone except in two injustices in my life where I was absolutely wrong. Okay, so the other thing that makes Will very unique is 
he was, he was a logger by trade. <clears throat> and in, an, in one afternoon, he was lacing up his boots, and he cut his finger on the eyelid of his boot. And that led to blood poisoning, which ultimately led to the loss of his arm. Okay, so you have gentle giant, my great-grandfather, and you have one-armed nice man. So the, <clears throat> the only interaction that I can tell that I know was documented is in my great-great-grandfather's diaries, he says that Will Southwick hit him in the face with a shovel in a dispute over water. Now, what would drive a peace-loving, one-armed man to take on a, the Ogden Valley giant? I don't know. But, that, it, <laughs> but if anything could do it, it is water. And, th and again, this isn't a time uh, the Native Americans were still foraging in Ogden Valley. Like the, the canals were first being established, but at the root of all their conflict was water. Now, fast forward to where we are now. We have agriculture, which I would say is the gentle giant in this room. Agriculture maintains most of this water in this state and has fed uh, our communities for generations and continues to provide significant economic return to, to all of us here, not only the communities where it's founded, but along the Wasatch Front where maybe agriculture isn't as noticeable. Yet there is beginning to have this conflict in, in this space. There are generally individuals who are otherwise have less water and maybe one arm and are, are beginning to say things that ag doesn't need as much water. We're seeing conflict raise, uh, specifically focused around the Great Salt Lake. So this fight that is endemic to this state is remagnifying itself at, at a more regional scale. Now, what I, what I would say we need is we need the Matthios of the world. If you would have been there, my great-great-grandfather would not have bled. We, we, <laughs> we need research. We need to solve these difficult challenges with learning and education and time and pragmatic solutions which is what I hope we're going to have, what, what I know we're going to be discussing today and what I know Utah State's going to continue to put forth into the future. So with that, I will turn the time over to the main speaker. Thank you. Okay. Is that working? Very good. Commissioner Butters, Representative, thank you very much for those, those introductory remarks. Can you still hear me? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move around a little bit because this is a, this is a wide room and, uh, and I don't want to just stay here. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come today and to start and continue this, this conversation about optimizing water use in agriculture. Um, according to Envision Utah, most Utahns want agriculture to stay and even expand in our state and they're willing to do something about it <clears throat> so according to envision utah most utahns want agriculture to stay in the state and they're willing to do something about it today we're going to talk about how we prioritize water use to save utah farms and and beat drought my most ambitious topic ever <clears throat> Wicked problems or challenges are those that are really difficult to solve because of changing, uh, contradictory, incomplete information, and often there's no single solution. We have just a few of those in Utah. Exhibit A, the Great Salt Lake. Water levels have been decreasing over time and we recently hit an all-time low. Exhibit B, the Colorado River Basin. We're stretching the limits of this river. Lake Powell has also reached an all-time low, and this is after two decades of, of drought. This pressure on the Colorado River is coming to a head. Just in June, the commissioner, the Bureau of Reclamation, has called for a cut of two to four million acre feet of water in the basin and gave the states 60 days 
to come up with a plan or their Bureau of Reclamation would, would give them a plan. What does this mean for Utah? Simple answer, it's not good. <laughs> so in Utah, about, about half, our, our allocation in the Colorado River is about 25% of the water. That 25% of the water in the upper basin supports irrigation in about half of the state. That covers 400,000 acres and is a little bit over 1 million acre feet. So now you can imagine if Utah is asked to put our share into that cut of 2 to 4 million acre feet, that's almost all of the water used in that region. It could have drastic, drastic effects. Now, we don't, we don't have time for exhibits C through Z. <laughs> These these two examples are some of the most difficult challenges that we face for our water future in the state. But there are many, many other examples at the local, the farm, at, at uh, basin levels. But these two exhibits clearly show that there has never, there's never been a greater need for water optimization in the state of Utah. And, and we have to come up with creative solutions to address these, these wicked, these challenging problems. In honor of Representative Tim Hawks, <laughs> who's a master at using cartoons to, to make important points, uh, we, we've got to find these creative solutions so we avoid scenarios like this. So, before, before we get into this discussion about how to optimize water, I think it's critical to define what it means. It can mean a lot of different things to different people and to different entities. For today's discussion, I'm going to define it as trying to achieve the maximum benefit for every, every unit of water consumed. And usually I think about it an acre feet, just because it's, it's simple and it's, it's big. Okay, so in Utah, we use, we divert, when it's available, about 5 million acre feet of water each year. And it's no secret that the lion's share goes to agriculture. And that causes some to wonder, why does agriculture need so much? and they must be wasting a lot of water. Why does agriculture need water? It's a simple answer is that it takes large volumes of water to produce any type of food. This little calculation here humbles me. If you imagine every time you go to the grocery store, and I have four kids, so we buy a lot of food. <laughs> imagine how much water you're hauling out of the, the store each day. It's, it's incredible. So each of our water footprint is, is the largest for the food that we consume. So if you want to reduce your water footprint, just eat less. But don't do that for too long, because eventually it will stop. And that's what we're trying to avoid. On a more serious note, the county commissioner in central Utah recently, recently was speaking with an extension agent and told this agent that for the first time ever in their life, they are seriously worried about starvation in their county because of food shortages and supply chain issues, and extreme inflation. <clears throat> Agriculture can improve its water use, can become more efficient, just like any industry. There's always inefficiencies. But by and large, this industry puts its water, that lion's share, to a very beneficial use. Agriculture is the first industry in the state has grown 
to include about 18,000 farms that occupy about 11 million acres, provide roughly 18,000 jobs, and contribute about 15% of our, our state's economy. Now these benefits are, are a little easier to quantify than, than the others that, that Commissioner Butters talked about. There are many social, human health, environmental, and food security aspects that the agriculture industry provides to our state. Uh, and those are more hard to, to quantify, but they're valued. Frankly, rural communities in Utah would not exist, many of them would not exist without agriculture. It, it is the lifeblood of rural Utah and the economies there. These reasons are likely why most Utahns report that they're willing to support this industry and they're willing to make changes so that it can thrive and, and even expand if possible. And they say most that they're willing to use less at their home. They're willing to avoid development on agricultural land and they're willing to spend more on investments in irrigation improvements so that farms can, can thrive and can survive. Before we talk about how we optimize water, I, I must acknowledge some incredible, outstanding efforts that have been made to optimize water in Utah. Commissioner Butters mentioned a few of these, but the, U, the USU Extension Water Initiative that was created six, seven years ago, the Utah Agricultural Water Optimization Task Force initiated by Governor Herbert, and the institute that's supporting this event, and the water optimization program that spent, it's spending over $70 million to make improvements all of these and many others are making huge, a huge difference in Utah. They're moving the needle. We are addressing water optimization like we've never done before. So now for the billion dollar question, how do we optimize water use on Utah farms? So they can thrive, so cities can thrive, so other in the environment can thrive? This is a difficult question. Usually we start this conversation with discussing water delivery or conveyance to the farm. When we improve this delivery, it can make huge, huge impacts on water use and reduce water loss. But it is very, very expensive. The task force recently estimated for the state of Utah to make improvements to our water delivery systems is going to exceed $5 billion. It's a high cost. I'm going to spend more time on what happens when water gets to the farm. This, this is where farmers have more control. When water gets to the farm, I like to think about it in four, four ways that we can, can optimize water. First, the irrigation system, how the water is delivered to the crop. Second, irrigation management. There's also factors about the crop and the soil management that can be used to help, help optimize water. <clears throat> A long list of collaborators and I, each year, conduct about 20 to 30 research trials on farms in Utah to try to understand how these factors, these four areas, might help us optimize water use. We've looked at them individually, and we've also, at a few sites, tried to start putting lots of these approaches together to see how sweets or combinations of them are going to cumulatively help us optimize optimize water. First, irrigation systems. There's many ways to irrigate crops. 
each irrigation system has water loss. There is no system that's 100% efficient. The type and the amount of loss also varies with the systems. And the amount of that loss that can be recovered also varies. Some lose a lot, and we can recover a lot. I just want to show you one quick example. Surface irrigation, flood irrigation, often becomes a target. Why would anybody use that? So inefficient. Here's just a quick example. If you furrow irrigate, this is a type of surface, look at its loss, about 40%. You compare it to some sprinkler types, hand lines, solid sets, wheel lines. The loss is about the same, but the recovery of that water is much, much higher. So those two factors are, are critical, and we cannot forget them. We have to consider its efficiency, and we have to consider the recovery of the water when we compare systems. Now, each of these systems, we can improve efficiencies. There's lots of ways to do that. Today, I'm just going to talk about one system, center pivots. This system is used more and more in Utah, mainly because it's efficient, it's easy, and it saves labor, which is another, you could spend a whole landscape talk about labor shortages in the state. For center pivots, if you've seen these around the state, you'll notice that most of them have sprinklers that we call mid-elevation sprinklers. They're about this high off the ground. And they work well because they get, they get good coverage. But there's other systems that are low elevation that now get the water just a few feet off the ground. And by doing so, they need tighter spacing. When we do that, generally we improve irrigation uniformity, we reduce wind drift loss, we reduce evaporation, and, and we increase efficiency. Uh, likewise, another system has re recently entered the market, and it's drip irrigation for center pivots. You take drip lines, you attach them to the pivot, and you drag them in a circle. Um, it, it provides similar benefits to the low elevation systems. So, for the last several years, we've been comparing these low elevation sprinklers to the standard mid elevation sprinklers uh, to see if we can use less water and still maintain production, still maintain yield. What we're finding so far is that the low elevation sprinklers for corn are, are often successful. 70 or 80 percent of the time we can reduce water and maintain production in corn in alfalfa it has not been the case mobile drip irrigation the idea is is exciting the the implications of it and the implementation of it are challenging and subsequently we've seen just infrequent ability to use less water and still maintain production. There's lots of things that we can do to improve irrigation management to optimize water. I'd like to invite you to central Utah to hear from Jody Gell, an extension agent, talk about some of the things that, that can be done to improve irrigation management. We had three different treatments that were applied by this research span. In the final third of the span, we uh, uh, put on nozzles that were designed to be 10% less, and that's where we studied the effect on yield. I'm Jody Gale with Utah State University Cooperative Extension Service. I'm located in Sevier County. We have been able to save about 10% of the water uh, that's used by this field uh, without significantly sacrificing yield. Each one of these wires is connected to a soil moisture sensor that's buried between one foot to six feet deep. With this type of technology where you're measuring what's actually in the soil, combined with weather data from the weather station, uh, that provides the database uh, necessary to be able to uh, control the center pivots on how much water they apply. 
as uh, the growth of Utah continues. We can't take all of the water away from agriculture because that's the source of our food. In order to be self-reliant or self-sufficient in the state of Utah, we need to be able to retain uh, irrigation water availability for our farmers. In Sevier County in the last 20 years, approximately uh, a third of the uh, water that is used here has gone from traditional fur or flood irrigation and installing mechanical systems which are much more efficient at irrigation. So agriculture is already working very hard. Our farmers and ranchers are spending literally millions of dollars uh, on uh, new systems to be able to conserve water within the state. We wanted you to have the real life experience, so we, before we went there to film that video, we ordered some wind, <laughs> and it, de it delivered. So, <clears throat> Jody, Jody mentioned a study that we conducted on 12 farms in central Utah uh, over three years. In this study, we compared how farmers were scheduling their irrigation, which is mostly based on their experience doing that for years, to some more advanced ways to do it. And we looked at three different tools. One was using weather stations, another was soil sensors, and a third was a commercial model, a program that automates irrigation scheduling. These three approaches to advanced irrigation scheduling rarely impacted alfalfa yield. And only in about half of the cases did they reduce water use. When they reduced water use in 2019 and 21, we could reduce water use by about 10 to 12 percent without impacting yield. What this means is that farmers' experience has treated them really well. Their irrigation schedules were very comparable in a lot of cases to these advanced tools. It also shows, though, that there is opportunity, especially in extreme weather years, to reduce water use when using these advanced, these advanced tools. The tool that, that worked most successfully at reducing water use was the soil moisture sensors. This makes sense because it's a direct measurement in the field of what, what the water need is. In addition to irrigation management, there's also lots of crop and soil management things that can be done to help improve water use. I'd like to invite Christy Davis with the Utah Association of Conservation Districts to tell you a little bit about some of the efforts that are happening with soil health and its relation to water optimization. In 2021, we were able to have legislature pass a bill to recognize soil health as an official state program. Hey, I'm Chrissy Davis, the director for the Utah Association of Conservation Districts. So we work with Matt Yost and USU as part of our soil health partnership on a conservation innovation grant to research soil health here in Utah. The data is for us to then share with producers throughout the state so that they can understand the benefits of adopting some of these soil health practices to reduce that use of water, um, but also to improve the nutrients in the soil. So as you can see here, this producer has taken an inner seeder to put in a cover crop in between his corn rows. The benefit of this is to cover the ground so you lose less moisture. Then in the fall, after the corn is harvested, the farmer is able to bring his cattle back in to graze off this interseeded crop and it allows him to feed his cattle for approximately six more weeks. Many of us who are out here working on the ground um, are very opt optimistic about the new innovations that are out there to help us conserve water. The research is needed. It's not been done here in Utah in the past, not only helping us with the drought, but helping our farmers and ranchers to increase their production. In addition to intercrops that Christy talked about, we've also begun to look at other factors 
that might influence water use, including biochar applications, drought tolerant crop genetics, reduced or no tillage, and a variety of cover crops. So far we've seen that some of these practices provide lots of soil and crop benefits. However, we have yet to document that we can increase or decrease irrigation or water use and still maintain production. So we've got, we've got work to do here. Even after all of our efforts to optimize water, sometimes there's just not enough. When there's a drought, farmers take the brunt of it. They're impacted by drought more than, than almost anyone else. And often when they're short on water, they're forced to deficit irrigate or under irrigate or fallow, not irrigate. Uh, the, the, goal, the goal with deficit and fallow is often to avoid the scenario of buy and dry, where land is purchased for its water and then abandoned. We have been testing deficit irrigation strategies in corn and alfalfa to learn how to best deficit irrigate when needed. What's the best timing and way to, to use less water? So far what we've seen is that a, a uniform under irrigation all season has produced very similar results to a targeted reduction where we deficit irrigate at certain times in the season. This means that it may be simpler for farmers to deficit irrigate and this information may help inform new water markets. So how, how do these options compare and what do they cost? One metric that can be used to compare these practices is the cost per acre foot of water saved per year. You'll notice quickly for these 15 approaches that we've estimated this metric that there's a lot of variation. Uh, you'll also notice these highlighted practices or ones that we've been talking to, about today are some of the lowest cost options. Modifying irrigation systems using soil moisture sensors to schedule irrigation. Now this cost is going to be extremely variable from farm to farm. To aid with that, we've recently developed a interactive calculator to help farmers, water managers, others uh, assess different options, customize it with their costs and their expected water savings, and then use that to prioritize water optimization on the farm, at the basin, at the state level. So in summary, what does this all mean? <laughs> For irrigation systems, we're finding that advanced pivot irrigation si systems or low elevation sprinklers can often reduce water use by 20 to 30% without impacting production. We're also finding that soil moisture sensors were the most effective among other scheduling methods at reducing water use by 10 to 15% mainly in extreme years and on some farms. Soil health, we're seeing crop and, and, and uh, soil benefits, but we have not yet seen the ability to, to reduce irrigation uh, when using some of those practices. Okay, so now you're wondering what next? Where do we go from here? There was about over 40 people on the Utah Water Optimization Task Force, who spent over 2,000 hours the last two years grappling with this question. This group produced a report, a short report, four or five pages with recommendations on, on where we go from here. It's also been mentioned that the governor's recently released a plan for water action in Utah. Much of this plan drew from the, the uh, recommendations of the task force. 
So what I'm trying to say here is that it's really hard to top this collective brain power that's went into figuring out how to prioritize optimization in the state. So what I want to leave you with today is just five, five ways that personally I think we can, can focus on to better optimize water in Utah. And many of these just reemphasize what's been discussed in, in the other reports. First, this comes up in every single water meeting I go to. Measure, measure, measure. It is so critical that we provide and expand support for water measurement. We, we, this expression you'll hear, we cannot manage, but we can't measure. So anything we can do to expand a risk-free way for farmers, water managers to measure water, we need to do it. Two, appreciate all the support for research at USU. We, we need to continue doing it. We need to validate these approaches, make sure they work and where they work and how putting different options together is going to cumulatively optimize water use. Three, education. As has been mentioned, there's a huge need to educate Utahns on what, why it's so important to optimize water use and what we can do about it, what they can do about it. It's also important to educate farmers on which of these approaches might be most feasible and help them adopt, adopt these practices that work. Four, water markets, in my view, have to be established. We have to learn how to move and transfer and purchase and lease water because it has to move in order to meet the needs. And we, we have to understand how these markets are happening because they're already happening in Utah. Farmers trade water all the time. We have to understand how they're doing it and then pilot and test and develop programs, markets that are going to work for them, that they're going to accept. And finally, we need to empower and incentivize farmers to optimize their water use. Every farmer that I talk to says, if there's an incentive, I'll do it. I'll share my water, I'll lease my water, I'll optimize my water if there's an incentive. And so we've got to find ways to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for sponsoring this event participating. I want to thank a long list of collaborators that helped make this possible, especially the farmers that we work with. They are so gracious to let us come on their farms, affect their operations, sometimes cause losses, so that we can research and study the best ways to optimize water use. Thank you. question. I, I believe it's the Utah Colorado River Authority, but I am not sure. And if, yes, I'm getting thumbs up. I think they're the primary group responsible. And I do not know where they're at. If somebody, is anyone involved in that that could report on that? What's that? They did submit their plan? Can we see that plan? Is it public yet? Okay. I, I don't Very good. know if there's any plans to help the local uh, 
I go to the farmers markets here in the valley, and I have noticed a great deal of growth in that sector. And are you? And is there beginning to be work with those folks? And have a because I think that because I really value that food source, and I think that's really important for us. Great question. Um, the answer is yes. Things are happening. Um, and yes, more things need to happen. Uh, the, the positive and the really good thing is that a lot of the principles that we talk about for optimizing water use apply at lots of scales. Small vegetable farms up to large grain or forage farms. And so, uh, so there's things that are happening and that are applicable. Uh, there's more that needs to be done. One fortunate thing that, that's happened in just the last few years is that we've hired a small farms and urban agriculture specialist who works with a lot of small farms to, to help help with some of those issues. I'm going to ask each person to stand up when we have the question so you can see who's asking it. <clears throat> I have a question on your optimization studies. Did any of those setups include pivot grazing? Um, we have not looked at pivot grazing. Um, that's a good next study. So if you have some cows and a pivot, let's talk. And let's see what we can do to, to look at some of those other options. I love that. So, thank you. Oh. Great, great question, and thanks for bringing that to light. Uh, indoor production of food, we can really increase water use efficiency a lot uh, because we can recycle that water. But we also really increase energy costs when we do that. Uh, one of the professors at USU likes to say, it is very difficult to compete with the sun as an energy source. So, so it works, but it's extremely energy intensive to do, do that type of indoor production. Um, and it's extremely expensive to do it at really large scales and to produce large, large quantities of food. So there's a place, it works, it will grow, that industry will grow over time, uh, but I don't ever see it replacing large scale agriculture that, that's required for large production of, of grain and, and forage crops. You might want to say your name, too, when you give your question, so everyone knows who you are. <laughs> Hi, uh, Terry Morasco. I <clears throat> didn't see much about which plant does best in which spot, mm -hmm. particularly for the driest states. Is there much research on that? There, we're starting to look at that. Um, so, and I didn't have time to mention I apologize. There's lots of alternatives to the crops that we we grow the most, alfalfa and corn and wheat. Um, and some of those alternatives are sorghum, teff, um, other grasses. Um, those crops do well. They, we can grow them here, a lot of them here. Some of them use less water. Uh, generally, with some of those, when we use less water, it also means we get less yield, less forage, less production. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. The other challenge is just markets, right? Far, every farmer that I talk to will say, if there's another crop option, sign me up. I'll grow something else. I'll diversify my farm if, if you can guarantee that I'll sell it. If you can guarantee that there's a market for it, I'll grow it. Um, but that's, that's the challenge, is that we, a lot of these alternative crops, we don't have a market. One example is quinoa. A few years ago, oh, lots of excitement about quinoa. And, and so we started studying it. A few farmers started putting it in their fields. We got a few center pivots of it, and then bam, we flooded the market. Um, and so, so that's another challenge, just creating these new markets for alternative crops that are going to make them viable. 
But yes, we study them. Yes, we look at their water use. Yes, some of them can reduce water use. Sometimes that comes at, at less production. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is a great conversation. I want to make a suggestion. It's just me working. I read an article in the local newspaper not long ago that talked about the water being lost by our municipal systems because of the poor infrastructure. Yeah. When you include them in this discussion, they're talking about billions and billions of gallons of water being lost every year. They use a scenario so many Deer Creek reservoirs are being emptied every year. Yeah. So, you know, this needs to be combined with not just agriculture, which is important. Mm -hmm. It's also probably a very important commodity. Look at the impact on our state. We need to expand this into other areas. There may be some opportunities. Uh, but made, I just, if that's a bankrupt point in my life. Mm -hmm. That's why this may help to fund some of these projects that the state could be involved with, as well as the local uh, Indians. Yeah. And just, it's just a thought. Agriculture is not being picked on. This affects the entire state. The Great Salt Lake goes dry. It's going to wash the shrub and just pack up and move away. Yeah. Remember, just thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I tried to convey that it's, it's all of our challenge. It's everyone's challenge. And water reuse, if you were alluding to that, is a big opportunity. If we can, yeah, if we can figure out how to reuse that water, we, we should. We should. Thank you. I'm Lynn DeFreitas. Um, if I may, I'd like to bring Great Salt Lake back into focus. Um, since it is a global food producer through brown shrimp and aquaculture, um, I am, we are, many of us are deeply appreciative of legislative tools that have evolved over time water banking, split season leasing, and um, most recently HB 33 um, to enable agriculture to be um, a key part of the solution for Great Salt Lake. And so in, in my work to preserve and protect the ecosystem, I always introduce agriculture as an asset because I do believe that that is a major player to make the future of Great Salt Lake the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. We need to share and spread that message even wider, I think. That's a great thought. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Keen. I'm just wondering how much food produced in Utah stays in Utah? That's a good question, and it's hard to track. And I don't, I don't know good figures and numbers on, of that offhand. Um, if you look at direct consumption, maybe someone does. If you do, that'd be great. Direct consumption's pretty low, like vegetables and fruits. Um, well, here, you just, you, Commissioner Butters, yes. Okay, sorry. I can tell you about the dairy industry in Utah. We consume 94% of the dairy uh, products that are produced here in the state. And that's probably the highest industry as far as what we, what we grow what we consume. Thank you, very informative. The five items you mentioned about were major research education. The last two were water markets and incentives. I uh, see the water markets and the incentives that are going on the western slope of Colorado and it's all large dollars from the east coast to the west coast buying up. I'm curious at how you would like to define or how you perceive the water markets being defined in the state of Utah and where the incentive is going to come from to keep the water here. That's a great question and a difficult question. <laughs> um, so my understanding is a lot of irrigation companies market water among users. They share and they use water and, and give water when it's needed to other users in the company. Moving that water from company to company doesn't happen much, or from company to um, other uses, environmental uses, lake, stream, river, uh, don't happen that much. So I, I would envision it as creating, try to understand how those markets are happening, 
currently, how water is being shared among users, and then trying to figure out how to get some more people at the table. Other entities that might want to use some of that water. Now, that's the challenge, right? Are outside entities going to come in and, and say, well, we want to buy Utah water now? And, and some of us may not like that idea. And so, yeah, I, I don't know exactly how that will look and how we figure that out. But I think local, regional, entities coming in and helping to, to have a seat at the table and figuring out how can we work with existing markets inside of existing companies to see if they have excess water or they're willing to lease some of their water, how do we make those arrangements? Um, and how do we protect our interests in Utah from maybe outside interests that want a seat at that table where we should, we should have the first seats? Uh, market doesn't happen. Yeah. Unless you're looking at government to provide it. I don't, I don't know where that incentive is coming from. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly where it's going to come from. Um, and so, some, I know there's conservancy districts that are looking at this to say, okay, let's try to create some programs where we can help pay some farmers to use less water and then use that water for other purposes, to send downstream. So that might be one source. Um, I don't know if the, the, an industry could or would be developed, a private industry, to kind of develop markets and shepherd that and help fund some. That's another option, but I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how that could and should look. If you know, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, Brian Steve, uh, I was previously the director of natural resources for the state, currently here at Utah State. Um, it's a complicated question, and uh, right now there's not a great answer for how those incentives come to be, but for government. And there's a lot of people that are very uncomfortable with the idea of government being a whole-scale whole scale water user, or a whole-scale water user, or a large-scale water user across the state. So uh, what's happened in, in HB 33 last year uh, was a notion that you can preserve an in-stream flow, but that in-stream flow has to be held by one of uh, several uh, designated parties, most of whom are the state of Utah, either through the Division of Forestry Park, State Lands, Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, or State Parks. And that was a compromised position because a lot of people were very worried about this notion of, of who and for what holding the water rights. And, and I, I guess I will add just quickly there. So when I mentioned incentive, I was also thinking about law and laws that change that now support using less water and being able to free it up and sell it somewhere. And that, that creates incentive. And that's, as we've just discussed, some of that's happening. Uh, excuse me for not standing. James Payne, and actually I think that discussion has covered one of my questions, but I have one other thought that came to me. What responsibility does Utah State have for the um, Native American tribes within Utah and their use of water? Because I know that's a very complicated issue. That is very complicated. And I think our primary role has always been research and education and outreach. Uh, we certainly work with Native American communities um, and, and try to, to help, help them use their water and help, help facilitate relationships with others. Um, that's, that's the extent of what I know. I don't know if President Cockett could, could, or Brian could speak more of what's being done there. But. It, it's a work in progress. Uh, and I think there are a lot of things going on, most recently uh, in the Navajo area, uh, the Utah, Utah State is working uh, with the Navajo Nation, uh, developing a campus in Miami Valley, uh, and the state recently entered a negotiation with, or included a negotiation on water rights, 
And so we're really at the, at the table and deciding how to use, or how, how to help the tribe use this water that historically is not. President, anything you wanted to add there? Well, I was just going to mention, we now have an extension agent for San Juan Cows County who is Navajo, and she would be uh, located on our campus in Monument Valley for exactly that type of thing through horticulture uh, and, and soil land uh, that can help with uh, water conservation. So that's coming. <laughs> Thank you both. Yes. Hi, my name is John Contos. I'm a local farmer in Ogden, Utah. Um, <clears throat> I farm about 1.5 acres in about four different places. So Ogden, which is Pine View Water System, and then also out of Harrisville, which is flood irrigated. I also farm up in Eden, and that farm has a well. Uh, but I really like what you were saying earlier about being able to measure things because uh, that guy that had the system for the, that would be nice to see it trickle down as to any farmer, you know, good, good information, good state of the art uh, technology, because I think that's the way uh, we can really conserve water. Thank you. Thank you for that confirmation that what we do is meaningful and, and needs to be expanded and, and scaled. Thanks. water markets are kind of rising that you can kind of look to see if Utah or any other state that's in a mega drought could implement. And then the second one is, and I don't know if any, any lawmakers in the room want to speak to this, but has the state of Utah have stepped forward any incentives to reduce agricultural water? Um, and if so, what are those? And if, is there anything already implemented? Does that question make sense? Yes, it's a lot. <laughs> let's, let's split it and, and address the first part. Um, is there great examples of water markets in the West or other places that could be used as models? I'm not sure that we have. My impression is we don't have functional water markets like this anywhere. That everyone's struggling and grappling with, with how to make these work. Um, we're starting to pilot them. In Utah, there's been a few pilot water banks. Uh, some met with a lot of resistance um, because there's a lot of challenges to making them work. Uh, it sounds like a, a perfect study, one that I'm not aware of, to, to study what, what's being done all across the West and see what kind of models are working and why they're not working or are working. Um, so that, that would be a great, a great study. Uh, the, second, the second question. How are states, our states currently, is Utah, our state, <laughs> uh, providing incentives for farmers to use less water, compensating them to use less water? Did I understand that correct? Uh, Commissioner Butters or someone at the state government level could probably answer that better than I could. I don't know if we are incentivizing. I think the incentive there for agricultural producers is actually there's no reason that you're going to overwater if you're going to kill your crop by overwatering. Over the incentive is to use the right amount of water to the maximum production. And so I think the water optimization program that we've been talking about is actually an incentive for all our agriculture producers to, to uh, receive some help in, in making improvements to the, to the water system. It's a big incentive. Casey Wanda. Yeah, I, I can jump in as one of the lawmakers, I guess. Um, so I would say we've actually made significant investments in the last couple of years. We look at the Ag Water Optimization Program. That has its origins in the state legislature. We look at the changes we've made to water law, especially last session, we're allowing flexibility for agriculture to provide its water for other users. Uh, that's, that's coming through the legislature. I, I think fundamentally we're, we're looking at ways to allow people to enter into uh, contracts with their own private property and, and, and make decisions, but at the end of the day, water is, is an asset that individuals own. 
So you can only go so far. And the legislature and the state's never going to get to a position where I think you're going to see us mandating, um, but long term providing incentives, uh, fostering collaboration, building partnerships. That's, that's the direction we're going. Thank you both. Okay, I think we're going to have to bring the questions to a close. Let's thank uh, Matt Jost again for an amazing thank you. One of the things I know about research, to do the best research, you need diversity of thought. And that's why it's incredibly important for everyone in this room to continue to think about the major issues that we face and bring your perspective to these discussions. You asking questions inspires us to think about what the next generation of research looks like. And we need that input. So thank you all for being here today. Now, November 3rd, I would like to see you all in this room again. Our speaker is going to be Professor Joanne Enterwada. Her expertise is around the Great Salt Lake. And I'm told by uh, the researchers in that area that she's going to have some exciting new data to share with us at that event. So please put that on your calendar, November 3rd. There's a flyer on your table to take home with you, to put on the refrigerator to remember. Second of all, we also have a second series called Blue Plate Research. And on September 9th, at the Gallivan Hall, we're going to have one of our uh, most recognized researchers, Professor Greg Madden, talking about impulse decision making. Professor Madden is recognized for his research on a national and international level. And so I invite you to that presentation as well, again, September 9th. And finally, we are researchers at heart. We always want to improve. And so one of the things that's on your table is also a little card to give us some feedback on what you thought about today's presentation. If you could take a moment and just fill that out. On your way out, please stop at the table where you picked up your name badge, drop off the card, drop off your name badge because we're going to recycle it, and plan to be here again for the next Research Landscapes. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.